I caught sight of my reflection. I caught it in the window. I saw the darkness in my heart. I saw the signs of my undoing. Darkness still has work to do. The knotted cords untying, the heated and the holy, oh they're sitting there on high, so secure with everything they're buying. Politics 101. Introduction. This is the face of Gaius Julius Caesar, imprinted on a coin from the era of the early Roman Empire. Julius Caesar was a general in the Roman legions, whom had conquered Western Europe and Southern Britain for the Italian Republic of Rome. In 49 BC, Julius Caesar returned from his conquests to face accusations by his former partner in the First Triumvirate, Pompey and other enemies in the Roman Senate. By bringing his troops onto Roman soil, he broke the law of the Roman Republic. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon and entered the city of Rome, he uttered the infamous axiom, Alia octa est, meaning, in Latin, the die is cast. Caesar, during his five years as dictator of the Roman government, wrote a new constitution with three main objectives. One, to suppress all armed resistance in the outlying colonies. Two, to create a socially strong, centrally Roman nation-state. And three, to make the entirety of lands conquered by Rome into a single cohesive culture. To limit opposition within the Senate to his implementation of his social agenda, Caesar appointed its proponents to positions in the Senate, and to forward the cultural acceptance of his reforms, he passed a series of laws that remade every citizen of the Old Republic into a citizen of the new Empire of Rome. First, Caesar conducted a census, limited sales of luxury items, rewarded citizens with large families for repopulating Italy, abolished all trade guilds and labor unions as political revolutionary clubs, placed a term limit on all provincial governors, and restructured debt laws to abolish repayment of one-fourth of all money owed. He began a massive public works monumental building campaign, highly regulated sales of state-subsidized cereal grain food, planned the redistribution of lands to accommodate some 15,000 returning war veterans, reformed the calendar into the essential shape of the form we still use to this day, established a police force, and restructured city laws concerning tax collection methods. When he was killed, he had plans in the works for further monumental building public works projects, as well as two or three enemy nations picked out for possible military expansions. Five years later, General Julius was laid dead by both his friends and enemies alike in the shadowy halls of the Senate building after being declared Imperator for life. His last words were, Et tu, Brute, meaning you too, Brutus, speaking to Marcus Julius Brutus, an optimate senator, whom had long before opposed Caesar's first triumvirate. On the Ides of March in the year we now call 49 BC, Caesar died, and all his life's ambitious plans were brought to naught. His legacy remains, however, in the saying attributed to Christ regarding the duality of nature and spirit, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. Due to bold debt law reforms made by Julius Caesar, the coinage of Rome increased in value and what had been a city of bricks became a city of marble due to the replacement of lead-lined coins with solid gold. 
Thanks to the senators who assassinated Caesar, he did not live to see these reforms pay off. The imprint emblazoned on this gold coin from the later Roman Empire, the opposite side from the face of Rome's beloved imperator for life, Gaius Julius Caesar, commemorates his murder at the hands of his enemies in the Senate. The title Emperor of Rome became synonymous with his own name, Caesar, when soon after his death his adopted nephew Octavian defeated Mark Antony and disestablished the second triumvirate to become the first Emperor of Rome and the second Caesar to reign. Let us consider the symbolic imagery printed on the paper money issued by the USA today. Here we can begin to see the baseless dualism at the foundation for the entire economic dialectic house of cards can be easily eroded away by a simple enough reapplication of understanding of basic social ethics and cultural morals. To begin with, we can see the triplicity inherent in the design between the twin circular seals on either side of the back of a dollar and the slogan for the bill's value in between them. On the left, we have the reverse of America's great seal, on the right the front side of the same symbol, and in between them a slogan. The eye in the pyramid is on the left, the national bird is on the right, and between them is printed the word, one. Above this word we find in small print a pledge of our nation to the single deity of conceptual monotheism, the slogan, In God We Trust. While this may seem an innocuous enough slogan to find on money in a nation founded by supposed monotheists, it expresses an explicit conceit that results in pitting one monotheist person against another over the definition of, and thus existence of, an otherwise shared monotheist concept. This causes conflict between Christianity and Islam over the issue of the Hebrew faith in the same form of contest as that between Cain and Abel for the favor of their father, Adam's God. In truth, democracy is founded on an autonomy from religious beliefs, and thus to pledge allegiance to one nation under one God is to divide the nation's government against itself. If the separation of church and state is not sacrosanct, both must be held in doubt. The statement, In God We Trust, being printed on our nation's money, makes it appear as though citizenship in our democratic government depended on our religious belief in a monotheist concept of God. This is, however, the opposite of the truth in this case. Democracy is based on rule by a plurality, as opposed to rule by a single deity as in the monotheist concept. But this form of using religious language to blaspheme the best form of fair government is not new. So to see such a slanderous slogan appear on paper cash is so ironic we accept it as divinely ordained. It is not. Nor is the God referred to on money, the same God conceived of by the triple children of the Western monotheist traditions. The God meant by the word being placed in the context of being on money is, as taught by the great teachers of the monotheist religious traditions, closest to the monotheist concept of the devil. The devil, called Satan in all three monotheist traditions today, is symbolized by the evil eye, called the Ujat, Molech, or Malachio, of the great beast of ten heads and seven horns, called Tumegatherion, whose gematria is 666, the same as the sum of the sun, magic number square of Sorath, who is both Satan, the blind demiurge father, and Lucifer, the fallen antichrist son. Although the slogan below the cryptic graphic is discussed too often, the meaning of the first part of this banner, etched in an arc above the design, is even known to only a few. 
The slogan on the banner below is Latin and means New World Order. However, what is unknown to many is that the word translated world, which is rendered as seclorum in Latin, means secular as opposed to temporal, both terms denoting levels of power invented by the Catholic Church long after Latin ceased being a spoken language in a common dialect. Thus, originally speaking in Latin, no such word as seclorum existed. It was an invention of the Church to distinguish the authority of kings from that of the Pope. State governmental power they dubbed secular, and religious authority derived from temporal power. The slogan above this diagram depicting the devil, which completes the meaning of the too often misunderstood slogan on the banner below, is also in the language of Latin, however is not lay Latin, but proper, because it quotes from Virgil's epic the Aeneid. This originally Greek saying is quoted only partially and out of context here, and applied to a different subject, rather than in its original context, it is put here into amplifying the meaning of the phrase related to it below, New World Order. The phrase above is, in Latin, Enuit Cryptis, and means fortune favors. The original Greek saying was, fortune favors the bold. The meaning in this depiction's context is that fortune favors the New World Order. Likewise, the meaning of fortune as fate in the original context is replaced by the implication of money as fortune printed on paper cash. Thus, the picture of the great Satan, or whore of Babylon, is shown as encircled by the pronouncement, money favors the new world order. That this meaning appears to be emblazoned on our modern currency is, again, too little of a shock to most complacent and conditioned U.S. citizens today, because to any student of basic civic history class in the USA, the phrase, New World, denotes to us now what the phrase, New Atlantis, once meant to Roger Bacon, or the idea of the American colonies as an apparatus for conducting a great experiment in democracy, as suggested by modern Masonic author M.P. Hall. Even from the point of view of the modern CFR Big New Brzezinski's grand chessboard, the New World of the USA sits in the center as the great bastion of hope for a global hegemony to dominate the rest of the globe. Thus, to the common or average person on the street, this slogan is meant to denote that the old world of Europe takes its military commands as marching orders from the new world of the USA. Those who have studied the subtle suggestions in this symbol's graphic design towards such banal and unquestioningly ignorant generalizations such as these commonly misconceive them as applicable to the majority of the masses, who they are misled to believe are simple sheep being led to a slaughter by such subliminal messages as these unquestionably are. They believe they know a deeper measure of meaning, a larger scale, a higher point than the rest. Let us examine their reasoning for thinking in this way. The thirteen steps of the pyramid symbolize the thirteen original colonies and the date, in Roman numerals, 1776, symbolizes the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, as well as that is the founding in Bavaria of Adam Weishaupt's Perfectibilist Illuminati, or Order of Illuminated Seers. Never mind yet that if this date had any sinister implication, it would be in its relation between the Mundi and Lux calendars of the Church and of Freemasons, or between this and the concept of this date on the Farsi, lunar, pre-Muslim, Hajj-dated calendar used by Weishaupt in the Illuminati. 
The architecture of the pyramid structure inspired the caste system described by Plato in his records of Critias's accounting of Atlantis to Socrates in his Republic. This work, beloved by early Catholic Neoplatonists, inspired the City on a Hill of St. Anselm, Christianopolis by Cretan de Troy, and The New Atlantis by Roger Bacon, as well as being, at the time of the Founding Fathers' drafting of the U.S. Constitution, a Masonic craft tool, the Beehive, symbol of the industriousness of a hive mind populated by neuter drones that had been adopted by Napoleon as a symbol of his hopes for a French empire. In the class hierarchy envisioned by Plato in his Republic, slaves are the base, serfs the middle class, and philosopher kings reign over and above all. The Christian symbol for God the all-seeing eye in a triangular halo hovers over the base symbolizing the missing capstone motif present in contemporary Masonic rituals. In Masonic lore, the lecture signified that the stone the builders rejected was the missing capstone, not of a pyramid, but of the royal arch of the Temple of Solomon. Again, the symbol for Christ as the stone the builders rejected is here replaced with a contrary meaning symbol depicting the usurpation by the Catholic Trinity concept of the monotheist God over the work of Pharaoh's slaves in ancient Egypt, underworld home of the dead. However, the eye in the triangle atop the pyramid with no capstone motif is not a valid Christian symbol for God, not even for the Catholic concept of the Trinity. Because it has three corner tips, three inner angles, three side lines, and is an equilateral triangle, one able to have interior corner angles up to 90 degrees each, and then only on a spherical surface, it can be a symbol of the Trinity and thus of the triune nature of the divine Godhead, However, because the all-seeing eye is peeking through this halo, presumably from a heaven beyond the mere veiling it from our own world, it constitutes a fourth trait, which combines with the Trinity to imply that God is not of a triune nature, as Catholicism stipulates, but is actually an idolatrous image signifying on a flat plane space the implication into our own realm in the 3D world of an imaginary point where none exists, rising above the triangle at the height of the eye to form a conceptual tetrahedron. The iris of the all-seeing eye, commonly called the eye of providence, is peculiar in this depiction from its depiction in any other source, be it a Catholic faith painting of the Last Supper by Erasmus, or on the folded overflap on the Freemasonic apron of America's first president. In the regard that the iris is not depicted realistically, we can propose thus it is not meant as an image glorifying the enrapturement of man's mind by thoughts of God, but as an icon signifying something removed from reality by imaginative symbolism, relegating the potential beautitude of its art to a mere pop logo of 200-year pre-data surrealist expressionism. The iris, as we can see here in this extreme magnification of the image, shown on the back of every single U.S. $1 Federal Reserve note printed since 1936, is comprised of three concentric circles. The real meaning of these three concentric circles, replacing the ordinary patterns of the iris, of the all-seeing eye of God is not known. They are not present in the original designs for the reverse side of the new U.S. nation's great seal. However, by the time the final galley proof was approved for printing of the symbol onto the back of the first pressed U.S. one dollar Federal Reserve notes with it on them in around 1935, the eye had an iris of three concentric circles. This detail of the picture is so small in the printed version of it on our paper cache 
that almost everyone would likely overlook it and not see it at all, ever. However, to those aware of it, its originally intended meaning can only be speculated upon. Some believe it to be an Illuminati addition to the motif, meant to appeal toward the three degrees of Blue Lodge masonry as signifying three steps up toward the pupil of the eye, symbolizing the lodge door, leading to an age of gold and enlightenment. Here we see the pupil of the eye shown on money that supposedly depicts the eye of the one true, universally known and generally accepted monotheist concept of God. The eye itself has a placid, calm, complacent, and serene glint that causes it to appear lazy, slackened, flaccid, and tired. The eye appears alike that of the oriental tankas of Buddha achieving nirvana. It transcends enlightenment. It encompasses serenity. The fact the ink used to print this image on money is green is no grave mistake either. Green's negative influences range only as deeply afield as jealousy and greed, while its highest levels of mental stimulation of subconscious inspiration are at most lust towards vegetative photosynthesis. Green is the central, neutral, or hermaphroditic color on the rainbow spectrum, and the balance in it of blue to yellow determines its ability to feed on light rays and thus leech also off our own brain waves. This image of a window to the soul of our supposed God printed on the back of cash is a wormhole through which the value of our money evaporates. Yet the half-dark, half-light, yin-yang-esque pupil of the green all-seeing eye in the triangle atop the thirteen-step pyramid printed as the reverse Great Seal of the USA on the back of a one-dollar Federal Reserve note is only one side of the depiction of this great beast of the Christian apocalypse by St. John of Patmos, here rendered as a blasphemy to the monotheist concept of a one true God. The other shows us the national bird, the bald eagle, holding in its talons on our right the thirteen weapons of war, called by Shakespeare in Hamlet the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and in the talons on our left the thirteen-petaled olive branch offered to Noah as a gift from God by the dove he sent out to find land from the ark after the flood, symbolizing peace. Just as the reverse of the great seal is labeled the great seal, on the reverse of the one dollar bill. So too is the front of the great seal on the back of the one dollar bill labeled of the United States. The pyramid symbol is labeled the great seal and the eagle is labeled of the United States to symbolize the autonomous authority of a sovereign individual of one over the other. The great seal or pyramid is subliminally dominant in to the eagle, which also faces to our left the location on the back of the bill where the pyramid is. However, the pyramid symbolizes the god of money and the eagle the state power of the USA. The eagle's wings are upraised in flight and its torso concealed behind a shield comprised of 13 vertical and 13 horizontal stripes again symbolizing the 13 original colonies to ratify the American Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. In its beak it grips a banner reading E Pluribus Unum, the Latinization of the saying popularized in the Enlightenment era rationalist Alexandre Dumas' novel about the decades earlier revolution in France to overthrow Louis XVI, the Man in the Iron Mask, where it was the battle cry of his fictionalized version of the contemporary musketeers. E pluribus unum, also not an authentically Latin saying in its original use, means all for one, and from the battle cry of the musketeers goes in its complete context all for one and one for all. 
The eagle, as it appears here, is exactly identical to the symbol on the seal for the executive branch of the U.S. government in every detail except for one shown here, but absent from the seal of the commander-in-chief. The star made out of smaller stars, i.e. a constellation, above the eagle is, again, purely expressionistic symbolism and not meant to symbolize any real constellation in the North or South Hemisphere. It is in the form of a hexagram pattern comprised of 13 smaller pentagon stars within its constellation system. The 13 pentagrams most probably symbolize the 13 founding colonies of the USA and their arrangement as pentagrams into the pattern of a hexagram is an unmistakably Masonic artistic device used to signify the microcosm of pentacles within the macrocosmos, or hexagram, alike the many souls of the one spirit, again traits attributed to the one true God. This stellation is amended to by 28 outward radiating in four quadrants of seven each lines signifying its emanating light. The next aspect of this diagram outlining in clear plain sight the body and tongue of the great beast significant of Satan to those who worship money is the head of the American national emblem a male bald eagle. The masculinity of the eagle is a symbol of the national spirit's virility its glare supposedly our military's acute attentivity and its strength supposedly symbolic of the potential for a combined focus of effort by the whole American population. However, the upturned feather at the back of the eagle's brow is symbolic not of the eagle nor any trait of its own, but is meant to be morally reminiscent to the fable of the fiery phoenix by hinting at the U.S. potential contemporary to the minting of this image on money for developing nuclear atom-splitting bomb technology. The original confusion of the eagle and phoenix began in Dark Age painted art by alchemists. The parable of the one bird with two heads, one fledged with feathers, and the other bald, without any feathers yet grown in, traces back to the earliest depictions of the double-headed eagle motif used first by the Habsburgs and Romanovs of Bulgaria and Russia, then by the House of Rothschild, and finally adopted as a symbol of the 32nd right status of Scottish right free and accepted masonry. The role of the eagle hinting at the dual nature of the hawk or phoenix firebird symbol is because the hawk is the dual heads of the Habsburg family, the bald eagle of the Scottish Rite Freemasons' highest degrees, the vulture, raven or turkey hawk, the heads of the Romanovs' clan, and so on and so forth. Thus the bald eagle signifying the unfledged nation arising in power, alike a phoenix from the ashes of war and peace, is also only symbolic in a larger, older set of alphabetic symbols of our own fledgling nation's military might. This great beast chosen as our national leviathan, from the zodiac of all possible choices, holds forth the banner stating, All for One, before a constellation shaped like the Star of David, seen later on the flag of Israel, comprised of pentagrams, often associated with Satanism, or with the U.S. Pentagon military headquarters. Having now seen the symbolic paths taken by the dual eyes of Satan and Moloch on the back of the one dollar bill, we can now examine the third aspect in this triangular dialectic, the first man on top of the entire worldwide occult network pyramid, George Washington. Just as the eye atop the pyramid symbolized the way of the civilizer and the eagle symbolized the way of the warrior, so does George Washington symbolize the way of the wanderer in this triumvirate of transcendentalist mind-state motives for socializing motion. While the warrior ignites off the civilizer's fuel below, the transcendentalist philosopher king floats above them like ash in their hot air. 
But who was George Washington? Was he really the first transcendentalist philosopher king in St. Anselm's City of God in Roger Bacon's New Atlantis? What is the significance to modern history of his indirect relationship to Adam Weishaupt? What secrets of U.S. national history remain buried alike the bones of this man, and how many others have been, like him, so pivotal to the providence of history showing any light at all upon the topic of U.S. democracy? Because if George Washington had been a bad man, and turned out to have surplus skeletons in his closet, then democracy could have easily been done away with as soon as he died. However, it is a credit to his honor that it has survived, even at the meager two hundred and a few years as it has since it passed from Washington's hands to ours, that is, to we the people of the United States of America. If one blemish remains to blot the soul's window of this one man, then the whole occupation of democracy and the pursuit of a more free and less restraining form of self-government could well have been written off entirely. So we must be very careful in how we choose to judge this man's soul as we seek to weigh it against evil incarnate in the form of his proverbial opponent's twin eyes upon the very point of the all-seeing eye in the triangle atop the pyramid with no capstone on the back of the one dollar bill. The back of the one dollar bill is thus virtually graffiti coated in evil and satanic symbolism. Does this make the opposite side's implication meaning that George Washington, the first U.S. president, was good, equally valid? Perhaps those lucky enough to have voted and elected Washington their first president simply saw him then exactly as we see our own now, 44 on down the line. That is, as the lesser of two evils, where the other is comprised of the political and religious leviathan symbolic of Satan. So can we use our knowledge of history to establish from a cursory examination of the intentions of the founding fathers of American democracy, whether the USA has it, it in its spirit to ever become a total dictatorship beneath an utter power-mad tyrant? Can there be such a thing as a Caesar over the form of our own modern politics?